started in the movie business, I went to the School of Visual Arts in uh, New York City. It's a film school. Yep. And um, that was a long time ago. So film schools were just, it was actually the second year that the film school even existed. And it was uh, very rare for somebody who went to film school to actually make a movie, believe it or not. I was the only one for that made a feature film for about 10 years. Oh. Everybody else wound up doing something else for a living. You know, it was very competitive, but because I could write, it was writing that got me into it. Because I wrote Squirm and people wanted to make Squirm, but they didn't want me to direct it because I had never directed anything. So I was um, insistent that I have to direct it. I could have sold the script for the same amount of money as I got for the script and direct it. But I, so that's how I got to direct it. Fantasy movies of like the big, big budget things are um, kind of like video games. They look like video games. They're designed to look like video games. Um, the CGI, I have nothing against it. It all comes down to story. I mean, you take, I just saw that uh, John Carter and people, you know, it's the biggest disaster of all time, really, financially. But if you look at the movie with the sound off and then look at Transformers with the sound off, physically, you can't say that one movie is better than the other. One made a billion dollars and one lost a half a billion dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's really always comes down to script. And what when you read about it, you read that people just don't care about what's happening. But technically, it's just as good. They're all, you know, they're all great technically. Yeah. You know, uh, so uh, it comes down to the screenwriting, and that's why when I saw uh, the best example was uh, Finding Nemo. Yeah. It was one of the greatest modern s screenplays. You know, and I thought it should have won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay. It's just an animated movie, but it made so much money, it was so popular because it was a great script, yeah, right? Sure, yes. so, and that has never changed, and that's why I could still work, because I could write. Yeah. Now, I say I could write. The only reason I could say I could write is because people pay, keep paying me to do it. I mean, anybody could say they can write or they can't write, so the only, it's like an artist that paints. Uh, the only way it's validated is if somebody pays for your painting. I'm, there's no good or bad in anything. So what's so what determines that this is an important artist? Well, because people pay a million dollars for his work. You know, yeah. Van Gogh, nobody would buy his work, so he was a nobody. Then after he died, they're paying so much money, so now he's a great artist. Yeah. So that's all there is. <laughs> Like, I don't consider myself a writer-writer because writers don't need screenplays. They can just write a novel. I never tried it. Maybe I could do it, or a play, but I never tried, and so I assume, okay, there must be a reason I never tried. Maybe I don't think I can do it. But um, everything I write is based on being filmed. So it's a different kind of writing. So then it's natural for me to say, well, I know exactly how it should be filmed because it came out of this brain, you know? I have not directed anything that somebody else wrote. I, the closest I came was just before dawn. Yeah. I didn't write the screenplay, but I totally rewrote it from the first page. Okay. So by the time I was filming it, and even while I was filming it, I was changing things to make it as if I wrote it. I wrote um, uh, Never Ending Story 3. Yeah. And I had nothing to do with the, the movie, and I, you know, <laughs> I, when I saw, I mean, I know the script I wrote, and I know the work I got based on that script, and I know I could have made that a, a hundred times better movie yeah, if I directed it, but, you know, what are you going to do? I don't go to cinemas almost very, very rarely because I don't like... The, the screens at home are so big now, you know, yeah. I have big, and uh, I get the screeners for everything. Okay. So you're watching something 
in high def at home with a great surround speaker system versus going to a cinema watching commercials that's what they do and bad music and some idiots you know and everybody on their cell phone there's no reason to do it i mean it's it's for young people to go on dates you know basically <laughs> I was president of the jury once before in uh, Malaga, and um, you know, I, the, I mean, being on the jury itself, being a jury and you're judging movies, and especially when it's young filmmakers and all, you want everybody to win because they're trying to compete, they're trying to make their way in the business, you know. So that part of it, I don't like to yeah. judge, you know. Uh, and then if you're the head of the jury, you have an added responsibility. If there were four people, you'd have a tie. If you had a tie, you'd be the tiebreaker, which is what happened. Um, we had five people on the jury in Malaga, but one of the movies was uh, Japanese, and they didn't have English su subtitles. They had French, uh, I mean Spanish. And um, I said, this is not fair because I turned, you know, I, I walked out. There was no point in me watching this movie and I don't know what's going on. And two of the jurors wanted that movie to be best film. And I wanted this other movie and this other, in other words, I couldn't vote, even though I liked this other movie to win. I thought it was clearly the best film at the festival. I didn't feel it was fair to not you know, give the other movie a chance because I hadn't seen it. And that, that's when I realized, you know, I don't want this to be up to me. It's too big a, a deal, you know. So I, that's the only negative. Otherwise, you know, you, you put together with some great people watching movies. What could be bad? Nishatel is, is uh, I've never seen a place like this. It doesn't even feel like you know, most of the European cities, they were all very similar with the cobblestones and the big church and, the, you know, it's, this is, I don't know, it's great. It's just fantastic. When we're kids, we hear about Switzerland, you'd think that it was all Alps. <laughs> that all the houses are up in the Alps and, and the German part of Switzerland, you know, and these guys with those big things, you know, and then yodeling and all that kind of, uh, it was an unreal place, you know, that, that existed, but everybody lived in hamlets in mountains, you know what yeah. I mean? And uh, it's beautiful, and I'm sure if you go to the Alps, it does look like that, but places like this, I didn't, you know, I didn't even know until now. Disgusting, of course they're disgusting, but I, I had to go to great lengths to make them scary because they're not scary because you don't think of like a shark. You hear a shark, it's gonna bite you. You don't have to see it in a movie to you know that, right? Or a lion is gonna kill you. But a, a worm, until you're shown otherwise, you can just step on it. It's just a worm. So I had to make that scary by it burrowing in the face. And once you see that, you go, well, these are not worms that I know about. And I don't wanna have anything to do with these worms. So that was the big assignment, and I guess it worked, because here we are, yeah. how many years, 35 years more later, and people are talking about Squirm, oh. which is amazing. The idea came from a real thing where my brother hooked up the a train transform, you know, the electric trains, yeah. into the ground, wet the ground to get the, the worms out, and put the light on so you could see them at night, and then when they put the light on, the worms went back into the ground, so you had to work fast. And the guy, Roger, in the movie, he actually says what really, he's just describing in the movie what I did as a kid. Okay. So that's where that came, that's where the whole idea came from. Cool. If you have uh, electric trains, it's a certain amount of volts, but if you have a giant power thing, that's going to be <laughs> a million times more, so this is what will happen. Yeah, it's like my wife said when I told her the idea at that time, I was 20, 25, and I said, what do you think of this? And I said, S-K-W-O-R-M, with squiggly, I wrote the, with squiggly uh, 
letters, and I said, um, uh, power lines go down in, in a giant storm and electrifies the ground, and the worms come out and take over the town. And she says, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. <laughs> Two years later, we're buying a house in Westchester with the money for the house that Squirm built. <laughs> so she was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and she says to me now, when I ever said, she says, it's still the stupidest idea ever. I agree. <laughs>